Thank you for returning from lunch. Um, today we're going to talk about trains, uh, more specifically about locomotives and how to hack them. Uh, usually when we talk about hacking, hacking trains, we are using uh, railroad situations or signals and switches, but today it's different. And the context for this talk is a derailment case that happened in the US during last May, and or actually one year ago uh, last May. Uh, May 2015, which a uh, derailment causes uh, eight people to lose their lives. And through that, that was um, speculated for a cyber attack. But first, um, hello. Oh, but first, my name is Moshe Zioni. Um, I'm working at Variant at uh, sec security research ma management and uh, researching security for at least 10 years or more. Uh, my main experience is for researching security and pen testing, and relevant experience for that talk will be SCADA, railroad companies, several railroad companies, aviation controls, um, 747, weapon systems, etc. Um, we're going to talk about locomotives, and, but first we're going to talk about the derailment case itself. I don't want to make, to make the case uh, itself, the point in this uh, talk. I want to talk about the locomotives in general and, and how to attack them, but not about the case. I'm, I will be returning to case for context and see what exactly could have happened or what Amtrak, the company, the railroad company that was in charge of this train, could have done better. So, when we are talking, before we talk, I, I should bore you with this slide. I'm not in any case related to Amtrak or Siemens. I'm not trying to insult them. I'm not a rail accident expert, and I'm not, I'm not willing to be. Uh, and um, most, in, most importantly, I'm not implying that whatever I say as speculation is true. What I'm, what, what I'm going to focus on is locomotives in general, and such locomotives as in the accident. <coughs> so this is a picture from the development case. Uh, it was horrible, actually. Um, there is a, the, the train went from Boston to Washington and went through its normal route. It's the Northeast Regional 188. Uh, it was May. Everything was perfect. The engineer of the train was just weeks into his job, but a very dedicated man, so they say. And all of a sudden, 60 seconds before this derailment, uh, the train began to speed up and then to overspeed up to 107 miles per hour. For us, it's 170 kilometers per, per hour, uh, which is actually huge in comparison to the curve that it went on. The curve maximum or limit was supposed to be 50 miles per hour. In large translation, half of this speed wasn't, wasn't supposed to be there. So as I said, eight men and women uh, lost their lives to, during this derailment, unfortunately, and most of the passengers got injured. More than 200 total passengers on this train is two, 238. You can see the engine and the uh, actual locomotive at the other, at the lower left corner of this picture. Afterwards, you see a rubble. This rubble is the, zip, the business section of the train, and then you see the diner quiet car, and then the Amfleet rest of the uh, coach cars for Amfleet. So there was much speculation, or little speculation, about cyber attack, but many discussed it within this community and afterwards. Uh, the media covered it not a lot, and because there is, there is no much evidence about it. Um, so many speculated about it and thought, how can we bring sh or shed some light over it? Some said that the engineer was just a scapegoat and no one really knows what happened. Like a month ago, uh, the NTSB, the National Transportation Board, uh, actually pointed out that the engineer was the fault of this situation and because, of si uh, because he lost situational awareness, the development came to be. And another thing about the, those cyber attacks is that just months before, uh, we saw three oil trains moving oil from one point to another in the U.S. and in, in Canada. Uh, it got blown away from some, for some unknown reason. 
Some not just speculated, one even said that there is, there is no accident in these bombs. But again, I'm not going into it. Last but not least about it, the Railroad Association denies any small train cyber vulnerabilities. Now, that's not entirely related to this, uh, to this derailment, but that's a shocking title because I don't know of any system without vulnerabilities. I'll be happy to know. And I, I would like to, uh, to assess that they meant to say that there is no known vulnerabilities in smart train cyber in smart trains. Now, as I mentioned before, when we talk about train hacking, we usually talk about uh, wayside communication, railroad switches, signaling control, and the control center itself. Not about the train itself or how to hack the train. One prime example of it is a Polish kid, um, a very smart Polish kid apparently, that configured his remote control to the television to be accessing the remote controls of the switches for his tram in his city and actually derailed the tram at his city by that. Now, when, when we look at this situation without being experts, and that's what the experts said, there is no switching or interlocking or signaling faults, almost no faults in the signaling, but no switching and no interlocking problems, which, as I said, is the common factor for cyber attacks. The railroad company was not involved in this attack if, if there was an attack. So the question is, what can speed up a train to such magnitude? So first, let's, let's get to know the locomotives. Today, locomotives are not the same as before. Modern ones, uh, modern are, are not like you think, with an engine room with lots of, of levers and switches and things to manually control. Everything in the engine room is automatic. There is a manual intervention if someone needs to do so, the engineer, but mainly he, he's looking over the controls and make sure everything is okay. The ACS 64 or Amtrak City Sprinter um, have, have emerged into the world to, in 2014 by Siemens and by Amtrak. And before that, there was the Eurosprinter and the Vectron. There are two, the father and mother of the ACS 64, which is similar models. It was designed by 1996 to 2001, and then again in 2010, which should give you context on the design of such things and what kind of security is in place, just a hunch. So the ACA 64 came into, uh, rolled out from Amtrak in 2014, and just one year, at least in one year into operation, this horrible development came into be. So, what is the automatic engine that we're talking about? There are locomotives that are separate. The engine is a whole separate container and the driver cab is, is separate, but in this case, the driver cabs, plural, and the engine is the same machine. You have, at the center, you have the engine and many computers, the CBUS 32, Siemens CBUS 32 is the flash, flagship, um, um, you, can th you can think of it, of it as an automatic system, automation system, or to say. And then you have a driver cab in, on each side of the engine, one front and one in the rear. So the CBUS 32 is pretty old. There, there is now, from 2008, there is a CBUS PN which should replace it, but in this case, according to Siemens documentation, that is the uh, operating system on this machine. Think DOS, by the way. Not old, I, I, I'm saying Windows 2005. I, I'm talking about DOS and about something very, very proprietary, nothing that, that, that we should know about. And the A64, like locomotives, are by the thousands in Europe and some in Asia. So what's inside? We have, at the middle, you can see the CCU, which is the most important part now. The central control unit is a unit that, that is modular. You have your, um, your kind of um, interfaces to the world. We will talk about communication in a second. Your interfaces, your, computa your computational modules. You have other modules that, that lets you operate under some stuff which, with these extreme conditions. We are talking humidity, you're talking about um, maybe weather, uh, which is extreme. And in this case, these modular components comprise the CCU. You have another thing that is called TCU at the bottom, that the traction control unit, which means that traction itself, and the, there is this thing called dynamic braking, but we're not, we are not going into that. So the traction control unit is, is a unit that operates 
the, uh, the underneath traction of the system and actually pulls, pulls up the, uh, in the entire uh, amp fleet. Amp fleet, in, in the case of Amtrak, which you can see the, one of the cars there, are not operated. There are locomotives that are just pulling and there are locomotives that are making the whole train go and the cars themselves have some, some power on, them, on themselves. The amp fleet track is not like that. So you have the TCU and you have the console, a driver's cab. As I said, there is another console, but it's not used, not, mainly not used by the operator. So you have the console. We have some, some other different components that I won't go into it right now, just not to be so confusing. I guess you are, so, you are already confused by that. And one other thing I want to mention is the air braking. We have several systems on each locomotive, not, not just like this, and on, on each train to, to get some kind of braking. There are several different methods of braking, and one prominent one is the air one. It's a pneumatic braking that is the equivalent of a handbrake in the machine, just using by air force. You are pulling a lever in this case, and pipes go throughout the train and put pressure on the wheels, and that's way, that way you get pressure and brakes uh, analogically, not, digi not digitally, and that's important. So, this is how the driver cab looks like. You have the air braking that I just mentioned, the red lever. You have side views, so you can view your sides with, uh, with cameras. You have signaling systems, which can give the uh, driver um, some, some support on his driving. And you have the screens, which is the main interest for the driver to look at. You have a throttle that make, make the, uh, the train goes, uh, go up in speed and down in speed. And of course, you have something very weird here, which is a, a, just a board covering up a hole in this case, but it's supposed to be a Motorola radio uh, to, to be used by train drivers. So, so far we, uh, we said a, a bit about those uh, machines, and what we want to talk about is now is how do, do they communicate. If I, if I call, come back to this screen, I'll see that the, uh, we actually communicate mainly with this orange thing. In this, this case, we'll call it from now on multi-vehicle bus, multi-function vehicle bus to be exact. And that's a protocol that is what was designed it, uh, at the late 90s uh, to support trains and mainly it, it was supposed to, to serve power plants as well, but power plants are not using MVB as far as I know. So trains are the main cause for developing TCN, Train Communication Network. And TCN is comprised by MVB, which is the multifunction vehicle bus, and the WTB, wire, wire train bus. But we'll, we'll be focusing only on one, on the multifunction vehicle bus. It's a small component. You can, you can think of it as a PLC if you know SCADA. And each component can be resolved into one or other um, functions around the, the train. The train has a, uh, a common bus throughout the train. Um, there are some, several configurations, but at the bottom line, you have a bus on the train that connects all the components. The bus is very important because the, the, the systems need to be talking in real time, and that's really support this notion. So it was operated as a single master, many slaves system. You have the central control unit, which is usually the master in this case, and you have many other nodes which would be slaves. For example, the TCU that we just mentioned is one of those slaves. What kind of components do can you can um, connect to it? You can con connect to it traction, brakes, not air brakes, seat reservation, air conditioning sometimes, not all, all the time, uh, door control, which is most basic for it, information display for passengers, and sometimes even a PA. So now that we know what we can do about it, let's talk about the physics. We have several connectors for it. By definition, the actual paper by IEC 61375 is displaying several ways to connect to it physically. Uh, if you know Profinet, uh, Profibus, it's really, really, really uh, equivalent to Profibus in terms of physical air. But then again, you can select every one of it. And the most, most easy one is the RS485. Now, when you have a physical access, and we'll talk about how to get this physical access in a second, 
uh, you are a device on the system. You are identified by, by, by an ID, and you will be identified by the master as this ID. All the components are on the same bus, and through that, you are receiving, only receiving calls. You are not initiating as a slave any kind of call. You're waiting for the master to pull status out of you. He can select several statuses, there are functions, he requests or pulls a request, and then you come back with an answer. This answer can propagate throughout many components on the train and can be considered as something that, that they can use. For example, as you can see on the screen, if the master is polling, is just kind of orchestrating, is not doing any decisions right now, but the, the master should poll. For example, the throttle. The throttle says, now increase speed, and this answer is read on the bus or off the bus uh, by the traction control unit. And then it knows how to generate speed. Now, that's the diagram. The master diagram is comprised both by a delimiter, now a function, function code, an address for the node that you want to ask or to pull, and then a checksum. The slave is pretty much the same without the function code. It just starting a delimiter, so you know that a slave. He starts with a data. It can be any, any kind of alignment that you see here, and then a checksum. Now, when you look at it, what are we missing? Pretty much everything, right? We're not using any kind of security on this level. We're using only the addresses that should be answering the master on his poll, and the data that is sent is plain text. Now, I'm not hiding anything, and I'm just saying my, to myself, these are the function codes. Just our reaction to that is, what year is it? What are you talking about? That can't be true. So I'm sorry to say, it is. There are some compromises and there are some advances in this field, and MVB has grown into something a bit a bit uh, less dangerous, but still dangerous because that's the diagram at the end. There are Ethernet connections nowadays, or more, more accurate to say industrial Ethernet, which is uh, a different kind of connector cabling, but it's the same on the link layer level. And, but you are not figuring out how to overcome the MVB faults. Needless to say that CBUS32 does not inherently can support this kind of higher kind of um, protocols that was designed over MVB, like, as I said, the Ethernet one, which is ECN, and something similar named TRDP. Now, after this, we know that what we, are, what we are missing is no authentication, the traffic is not encrypted, and there is no built-in screening process. You can screen by that kind of datagram because the slaves are not coming back with, with the slave's address. So that's a bit scary, but first I, will, I, I am going to scare you more than that, rest assured. But first of all, we need to discuss the master and the saying single master. All the documentation says single master all the time, which is pretty confusing because A, we know that's not actually a master, it not, doesn't master anything, it's just orchestrating the whole orchestra. And second, that's not true. You can have more than one master, but I'll get to it right now. How can we? And why it's important? If we know that it's so damaged from the beginning, what's the, what's the, uh, why, why should we take extra measures into this attack? So, according to our research on several companies, in, in this case, we had some, some very large problems on just injecting, injecting these datagrams into the network. These datagrams couldn't be just injected into the network because the master that was orchestrating the whole thing had an internal clock, let's say, which is, which is called a period, a basic period. In this basic period, you know how to ask the known devices. What is, what is wrong with you? What do you need? Please, please make an event, etc., etc. But in all this mess, we couldn't actually send something and be sure or deterministically sure that something will come up right. So we needed to, to overcome this. And the way we did it is just reading English. That's the power. They have a version in French, in, but I don't know French. 
as you might know. So this is the paragraph that I want to stand on because this paragraph encompasses two weaknesses that combines into one vulnerability or one privilege escalation, if you will. The first one is the marked, marked one. The master always scans the network or the bus to see which devices are there and to see what is redundant right now. If a device doesn't answer, he tries again and, and, and tries him another time because all the, the other thing with real-time situations or real-time operating systems, that something can, can go wrong and then you, you shouldn't lose hope. You're always asking. And what's better than that is always asking also on the unknowns. He's scanning the whole range all the time. It's basically an end map on the bus that actually all the time listing all devices and adds it into its known device list. The second thing is that it's called a bus administrator. A bus administrator, there are several classes of nodes. There is the basic node, and you have like six classes which differentiate in functions, and one, one or two of the functions are the bus administrator function. The bus administrator is, is special, very special, because what you see right now. Let's say you are a master. And remember that I said there is no one master. There is many. Or to be more exact, there is one master in a given time. And why is that? Because it needs to be redundant. He can't rely on putting all the eggs in one basket. He needs to be reliant on other systems, like the bus administrator, and to cycle through the token of mastership. So we, we want this mastership, right? We want to be masters on the system just for a little time. Now, let's say we are a node or a malicious node like, like we see in the picture. Now we just listen on the bus and enumerate devices. We have a list of devices on our node, which bus administrators should do in, in any case, but let's say we are entirely malicious from the ground up. And then we are selecting one of the IDs which is vacant, which is unoccupied. Now we select this ID. In this case, I selected a very special ID. And then we, we are just waiting for the master to ask the unknown device if it's there. And then we are, we are answering for his call, yes, we are here. But with one different bit. The bit is called BA, or bus administrator, which should be set in to one in the response. Now the master knows that we have this ability of bus administrator. And when we have this bus administrator, it lists us under the bus administrator list. And when the time comes, every so given minutes, it will transfer to us the control, expecting us to behave like a master and then transfer the mastership over. Now, now we are on his list, so we, we wait a bit longer, and then from time to time we will ask, are you free? Are you, are you idle? Are you okay? Are you not dosed in any way, denial of service for any, uh, for any reason? And if we are answering okay, he will accept it and send us the mastership. And now we are masters for a given time. The time is 2,024 milliseconds times something up to 2,056. Now, that's by definition. We can try to hold the mastership for a little longer, but, but the definition said that the master, or the original master, which is the real master in, in this case, which take over because it thinks that something went wrong or the now actual a master machine or bus administrator machine have gone wild and let's say he showed a diffuse or something and he's not responding. So he'll take over the token mastership and then he will be the master again. So we can with, withstand uh, several minutes, up to several minutes with this kind of attack over the system. One variant of this attack is a Sybil attack under this system. There can be 2,055 bus administrators on a bus. So if we are in the same node exploiting this behavior and actually using several IDs and then giving, giving us much more time to control the system without sharing it with anyone else, or at least for a short time. Now that we can see the attack itself, what can we do, it? What can we do about it? Or with it, sorry. What can we do with it? Basically anything. It depends on our knowledge, 
on how, how familiar we are with the controls and what kind of expectation will be for the controls. We can orchestrate the controls all over again. We can behave as a master as we will, but in time we'll know the, the exact locations where to put it and where to put a rest condition. For example, if we are throwing to the throttle a request and then after we are just initiating the datagram itself from the slave saying increase speed, it can increase speed. So, what are the vectors for this attack? We are talking mainly about domain, the physical domain vector. We can think of the electrical box, which is seated under any M-Fleet car, or in this case, M-Fleet 1 cars. Or on each end, if you have one end, the toilets, and the other end, you have an electrical box, which contains many of this operation. You can trim down the lines of, of electronics and then see where kind of uh, lighting or reservation you get and then maybe, just maybe, connect it. And you have several more. The supply chain itself can be harmed because 70 companies or factories were, were in fact in this process. And last but not least, there is tour guides into the ACS64 which you can actually open up the A64 driver cab and see the whole inside and go to the engine room and touch everything, it's, it's a blast for kids and for hackers. So, so far with, with the physical domain, now we are coming back to Amtrak. Now, I'm, now we should ask ourselves, is there a place where Amtrak can diagnose such an attack? So, that's a memo, I'm sorry that it's small, I'll read part of it. Um, that's a memo for Amtrak, it's called Notice Number 70. It was circulated around transporters, around the internet, and got up to the media in some, in some point. The media didn't release this paper, so I'm putting it right now. Um, so the paper says basically that one month after the attack, some engineers be, before that or um, amongst that, in any case, one month after the attack, the notice was taking place that some engineers complained about the devices of the ACA64, the driver's seat, the screens, froze. Now, that can be nothing, of course, and the, the suggestion here is just go to the breaker room, which is situated uh, um, after, um, just at the back of the driver, just pull down the, the, break, the breaker and then pull it up and then the screen will be all right. And the suggestion into detecting that it's, that it's true, the screens froze, is to look at the seconds of the, on the screens and see if the seconds doesn't roll up. So this is what happened just a month after, and this is signed by some of the seniors for the Northeast Corridor, which is the same corridor, the same area of happenings for the A64, ACS64. So that's for Amtrak on the physical layer. Now, basically, if we are good, if we are using MVB as, sh as we should, and we shouldn't, but if we are using MVB as we should, we are okay, because it's, it doesn't supposed to be connected to anything else, right? Right? What do you think? It doesn't supposed to be connected, but let's look for treasure, okay? Let's go wild. Let's speculate about Amtrak, and now I'm coming back to Amtrak, and what kind of communications can be applied, and what can we see on those communications? So, I would like to be cliche about it, if you will. The cliche thing to, to think about air gapping the system will be the entertainment system. So we are looking at the entertainment system, which was actually a great venture for Amtrak. They operated under the name of the Amtrak Connect, which was a huge Wi-Fi network. It actually still is, but it's re innovated right now because it's horrible, so, so the passengers say. It didn't work. It, it was very, 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 very slacky. So this is a beautiful uh, poster for the Wi-Fi uh, of Amtrak or Amtrak Connect. And when hackers see Wi-Fi, they think to themselves, why, yes, of course, Wi-Fi, cool. But, but let's hold our, our, our horses. We didn't say anything about the possibility of the Wi-Fi being connected to some vital systems, right? Good. For that, we have Amtrak's Inc. Inc. is an um, internal newspaper for Amtrak's employees that actually converse with some of the media and tech that they uh, implemented in their uh, systems. And this ink, in particular, was on March 20, 2014. And it exclaimed two things. One is the ACS64, beautiful picture. And the second is the Wi-Fi in the Midwest. Now, when we turn to page 9, we see this written. 
I haven't changed anything about it. I read it out for you. The equipment is connected to the central control unit, CCU or brain. The brain itself is located inside the train. Access points are what send the brain's communications, not my fault, that's the actual read, throughout the train and allow a customer to connect to the internet. Now, I really hope that's an error for whoever printed this, um, this paper, but in any case, it just exemplifies the case for Amtrak, which actually used this poster, which Wi-Fi connects you mo to more than your destination, uh, to emphasize the Wi-Fi connectivity. Now, okay, let's stop with the cliche. Let's, let's talk about something a bit else. There is one major component in each train, and specifically on Amtrak, and specifically, in, or, or more generally in the US, and in Europe, you, uh, we have uh, a very similar, uh, very similar system, which is called ATP, Automatic Train, tra train Protection, or the, in this case of the Amtrak, is the ACSES. Yeah, confusing, ACSES. And that's a component from Alstom. Alstom is one of the major uh, uh, companies for railroad uh, applications. And we have this. We have a major, uh, a very wide network over RF and uh, over GSM, or more specifically GSMR is the railroad GSM stuff. So GSMR and we have RF. And the whole components talk together in order to signal the system correctly. Now you might, you might think to yourself, there is no kind of way to connect to the system through that. But then again, A, we don't know. You, can have, you have the baseband chip, you have other stuff to speculate, but let's leave it like this. It only needs to stop the train. It only needs to say to the train or to the driver, stop or lower your speed. One of the things that the NTSB pointed out in their report is that one very, very small change will make this derailment disappear. But it's hindsight, of course. One of the signaling systems on the railroad wasn't operating at all. Amtrak didn't, um, didn't commence with it because they had no time. They, they meant to fix it until the end of December 2015. And so they did, as far as I know. But at the time, at May 2015, it wasn't in place. But if it was in place, it will solve apparently the whole problem. Now, this kind of net is connected throughout the US on many different producers, vendors that are using for this, uh, this equipment. And the equipment that we are talking about on the A64 is this one. Is Alstom Microcabmatic, that's the real name. Microcabmatic, which is operating the PTC. PTC is the ACS64 take, or the, uh, it's, again, the, the train protection system. Um, positive train control called, and it have both GSM and RF. But I haven't talked about how it's connected to, to our world, and I'll get it in a second. But before that, I want to show you how it looks like before it is installed on the train. That's a very, uh, very nice shooting of the microcabmatic on Alstom's uh, desk. But when it's installed, it's, it looks like that. And you have a screen there. And this screen shows Windows, which is great. We miss Windows, um, but but the, the say uh, say no more. We have Windows on the on the next steam and locomotive. I kid you not. So that's the situation. And, and until the, uh, until now, it's not great, but it's not so so bad. But now we are referring to the PTC's success. And by one of the administrators, the manager, which is on top of this Wi-Fi net that Amtrak has, uh, has uh, rolled out, is saying that utilizing the existing PTC infrastructure is critical for the success of the project. They actually used PTC's infrastructure to connect to the internet, meaning that the Wi-Fi on the train connects in some way to the PTC. The PTC have many other interfaces, such as MVB and Ethernet, and, and of course, the GSM interface. And through that, to save costs, of course, which is a business, business wise, it's a very wise decision, but security wise, I don't think that someone read, read through this article before it was released. So Amtrak is very excited with, with, about the possibilities that this could offer, and not only Amtrak. 
So that's about it about uh, about uh, about Amtrak's faults. And I want to wrap up the thing that we said and to summarize it all in a few simple sentences. MVB is old. We can use others. MVB is the it's not the only player in the market. And as I said, um, more progressed things. And if you build a new system, there is no much hope if you, are, you are, if you are building on top of something very old. No matter how the machinery is great, but we are talking security, you can use alternative networks. Air, gap, air gapping is nothing to be joked about, something that is, needs to, to be strictly enforced, and I, 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 I gave you no news on that. And please test your systems. We found several systems which weren't ga air gapped, or I'm not talking about updates, which are none, usually. Um, test your systems, make them testable. Approach, if you don't know by yourself how to do it, approach the professionals and they will do it for you. Um, but it was it. We are talking about lives, human lives. We're not talking about something that just operates and, and stops working for some reason. It can be really, really devastating. On top of that, I, I need to mention one more thing. I'm not saying anything about Amtrak, and, and quite frankly, Amtrak is not the issue here. We are issuing, we are, the issue is trains, and we need to, to come together either as a community and, and on the business level and think it through. If any one of you have, have done some skater work, you can say it by yourself, which is frightening situations right now, uh, and we should adhere to that. That's all. Thank you. Any questions? Hello, I'm Sebastian, I'm working for a French railway company uh, in Paris. Hi. Um, very nice presentation. I've done one myself uh, in UK last year about uh, uh, cyber security. Uh, can, can you please speak up? I can yeah. hear you. I've done the uh, same kind of presentation uh, as you have done, a uh, great presentation, about cyber security uh, for onboard systems uh, on trains. Uh, this is a huge problem, as you, you stated. I just have one question, or two questions, regarding what you said. Normally, on trains, you have got direct lines that can control uh, traction systems. So if the driver sees there is, there is a problem, he can push the red button, and it's a hard wire line that will stop all the systems. Uh, what is, has said Amtrak about this kind of problem mm -hmm. of, of system? And the second question. Do, do you want me to answer then ask you a question? So yeah, I won't, yeah you okay. can. Yeah. Uh, so about Amtrak, I don't really want to uh, progress on that route because I'm in the middle of asking Amtrak questions and not getting any answers. But I hope that it will come uh, on, on, on the right time for them. Uh, and, but seriously, I, I think that it takes a bit time to digest such a thing. And I have several things that are the most crucial about Amtrak that I didn't re release here. I'm just waiting for a a proper response before I can release it. I probably will release it on Twitter or something, or, on, or if I have some update on these uh, slides, I will update the, the slides. So about Amtrak, I don't really know about that. They, as I said, the NTSB have said that the actual engineer is in fault because he didn't pay attention. And if he pay attention, maybe he will, he will see that some light is, is, uh, is on. And that answers your question? Yeah, that's <laughs> mm -hmm. it. And the second point is, as you stated, uh, we have now in, in trains, Windows uh, embedded operating systems. Um, the main concern about that is that uh, train manufacturers are not willing to update those systems. Uh, we have to know that all those systems are, are designed for 20 years uh, old life. Uh, middle, a train is, is designed to to leave to run for 40 years, and we have got a half-life of 20 years. I hope I'm, I'm clear. Mm -hmm. um, and the main major problem we have seen is that they uh, implement, uh, for example, in, in the case of Windows, 
uh, service pack zero of Windows. It's just a release candidate of Windows mm. XP embedded. Um, they don't want to update it because uh, they say that if they update it, uh, our, their system will not work anymore on it. So what is your suggestion for, for this kind of matter? Um, I don't have anything to say about, let's say, a suggestion that, that is practical, because the, the, the suggestion should have a paradigm changing on the trains. Because I, I saw this paradigm changing on, uh, when, when I did avionics. And many are afraid of avionics terror, and I think that that's, that's one of the reasons why people pay attention when they said that, that airplanes can, uh, can go down from the air because of a uh, cyber attack. Uh, trains are, for some reason, are less uh, important on the media. I am, I'm not saying that, of course. Uh, and I think that one of the changes that I saw is moving, no matter what, to uh, new systems. New. New in case of something completely groundbreaking. I'm, I'm talking about disks that, that they needed to operate on one of the planes that we were managing. And then these floppy disks were changing by GSM over the air. And now they need to update the system one on, uh, once on the ground and once on the air, even if there is such a critical change. I hopefully not. Um, but I, I think that that's promise. I, I, I really need, I really want it to happen to trains as, as well. I, I don't want it to be uh, um, by scare tactics. I don't want to be the the one that scares everyone in order to do stuff. But but apparently that what what did it for avionics, in my opinion. Okay, thank you. I would be very very pleased to work with you on this topic because we are trying to work on that with Alstom. Uh, to, to make things uh, more secure for passengers. Thank you, me too. Uh, I'll keep this very brief because I think you touched on it a little, but um, building on what Jason was talking about in the last talk, do you have any lessons, uh, piece of advice on how to engage with industries after you make a discovery like this, the things to do and the things not to do, perhaps, just so for future people doing the same? Hmm. That's a very good, good question that I'm asking it myself, actually. And I found um, two major lines of contact. One is the line, uh, when, when we are talking with engineers, they understand the risk while, while we are explaining it to, him, to them. But when we are talking with management, they, they happen not to realize the, the risk as a, as a whole unless they come from computing or anything engineer style. So I'll say if you have um, uh, some kind of a CISO uh, equivalent on a train, uh, which, which happen to be with an engineer background or computer science background and, and can comprehend the risk on that level because, because it's, it, can, it can be something of a deadlock when we are talking about with management, but if you can uh, enlist an engineer to your lines before talking to management, that would be great. Someone from the inside that can affect the system and can, can know how to figure, figure things out in the inside. Because from the outside, even from a consultant perspective, when a consultant like me came to an, to, to an institu to institution and sent, said things like that, there was several eyebrows brought up, but, but they didn't do anything uh, more crucial than that in many times, and sometimes they actually did it when someone from the inside said, say, this is crucial. So that's my tip. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>